overzealous enforcement, challenging today's hardline narrative. Overregulation kills innovation and stifles the free exchange of ideas and information. The question is, where is the right balance to be found in today's various jurisdictions? Moderated by Joseph Borge, WH Partners. Santiago Asensi, Asensi Abogados. Eva Lehmann, WH Partners. Carl Brinkat, Malta Gaming Authority. Nicholas Aquilina, Brandel Antalos, Rexan Velte. Nick Nocton, Mishkon Derea. Hi everyone, um, I know it's lunchtime, but uh, thank you so much for being in uh, such large numbers in this hall right now. Um, so we're going to discuss a painful uh, topic, which is enforcement. Um, but we also know that regulation without enforcement is useless. However, overregulation and unreasonable enforcement action will simply drive the industry away from regulated markets. So the trick is we need to find the right balance with responsibility and with caution. So I'd like to start with uh, another a quote from uh, Heathcliff Farouja, the MGA's CEO. Um, uh, that he's been repeating this quite often in the past few months. I guess it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's a message he's trying to send us. Um, don't let enforcement action be the driver of compliance. Do you think, uh, this is a question for all of you, do you think that the industry can be proactive enough? I'll, I'll start us off fine. Since it's Heathcliff's quote, I'll start us off, I guess. I think the industry can be more proactive on certain aspects. I mean, we've heard Morris in a couple of panels before this speaking about responsible gambling, saying certain operators have decided to take responsible gambling more seriously ever since the UK started issuing massive fines. We don't want that. We want the operators to be proactive, to realize the, the, the priorities that we as regulators have, even through communication. And I believe that that proactiveness can um, avoid enforcement measures, or if not avoid, if mistakes still happen and enforcement is still warranted, the behavior uh, of the operators themselves will still be reflected in the eventual measure that the regulators will decide to take. Uh, uh, sure. Santiago. Well, I, I, I think so. I think that, uh, uh, that the operators can be absolutely proactive. And, and of course, it's going to depend also on the size of the operator. Bigger operators have more human resources and have more technical means. But at the end of the day, this is something that is going to be for the benefit of the industry, and particularly of the operator itself, uh, as it will grow its uh, reputation. It will be also good for the group of companies that uh, the operator belongs to. And in this case, I refer to, the, to those jurisdictions that uh, the regulator demands to be informed of uh, any sanction uh, imposed to such operator in any third given jurisdiction. So the fact that you are not they're more compliant in Spain can benefit uh, your reputation also in the UK, for instance. Um, of course, it's also good for, for, for consumers. Uh, the, the, the fact that the operator is more compliant makes him to play in a safer environment. But further to that, I would like to add the fact that uh, we should also think that uh, the operators, sorry, the, the regulators should be more transparent, more transparent in terms of uh, making the operators participate at the time of, of uh, building new uh, compliance obligations. And I'm not, of course, speaking only about uh, uh, the public consultation period, but, but also at the time of uh, making any kind of draft and so on. And this is because whatever is done should be, uh, in terms of compliance, should make the business viable. 12, 15 years ago, we were discussing about uh, the operators right, let me put it that way. I mean, operators should, be, should have a regulation, operators should have the opportunity of obtaining a license. Now we are discussing, now that we are in a much mature market, well, of course, I mean in the UK, in Spain, Italy and others, uh, not in Germany and, and the Netherlands, but, but in those jurisdictions where the baby has already grown up, uh, we need uh, to, I mean, now what is being under discussion 
is consumers' right and, and, and the compliance, of course, is for the benefit of them. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, to pick on what uh, Santiago just said, I think uh, it always takes two sides, right? So um, the operators obviously have, uh, in particular the larger operators, have a lot of um, knowledge and a lot of experience from various jurisdictions that they can feed into any legislative debate prior to new laws and new enforcement, uh, new compliance measures being introduced. Um, or obviously existing uh, legislation, existing compliance uh, regulations being interpreted in a certain way. But it also needs on the other uh, end a regulator, a legislator who is prepared to listen and who is prepared to learn from the operators. Um, the MGA obviously being a very good example that has always been trying to uh, proactively address topics together with the operators because this is one industry and of course the, the laws just get better if, if everyone listens to each other. So I do think that is, and you know, coming from a jurisdiction that has not yet regulated, uh, or at least not yet openly regulated, Austria, um, I do think that even more dialogue between operators on the one hand and, and regulators on the other uh, would make a lot of sense because there is a lot to learn from each other. Uh, I, I think the answer to the question is they, of course, can be uh, more proactive. Um, the, the, the real position, of course, is that they can't afford not to be. And the process that's been happening in the UK, we have seen through a host of license reviews, some of which have been more bruising than others, but our, our clients have had to up their game reactively, um, put in place frameworks which perhaps were not um, properly implemented before. But now they are in a much stronger place. Uh, to be fair, their, their business models have been affected by this on a, to, to, to um, reflect the more um, uh, aggressive or, or um, demanding requirements of the regulator. But it, it's, as, as panels have said before, corporate governance, the message needs to come from the top. As long as they do that, it is, of course, possible for them to be proactive. But it is no good um, uh, empty words. Uh, if, if it does, doesn't happen, it's impossible for the people who are actually on the ground trying to deal with the compliance issues to actually do their jobs properly. So that's the critical message. Of course, they can be more proactive. Um, can they keep up with the ever-changing demands of the regulators? Well, they have to do that. It's extremely challenging in a market where there's no harmonization, but I'm afraid that, that is the business. Yes, I agree with uh, other panelists that we have, we need more discussion between operators and between uh, regulators. Um, it's just a must. Uh, the, the two parties need to understand each other. And um, I represent, uh, I work uh, in Poland, so um, Polish market is very restrict, it's quite stable. But still, uh, I, I see there is a, a space for a discussion, and uh, this discussion is needed because um, industry, gambling industry, has this knowledge, has experience, uh, and the regulator not always has uh, the, the knowledge which is needed to, uh, to actually implement a, a good regulation. So it's, uh, it's just, like I said, it's a must. Can I just okay. say, I've been really encouraged by the, by the early, very positive messaging coming from the newly incorporated Betting and Gaming Council, um, which the RGA and the ABB in the UK, I think, proactive messaging, raising standards, but also raising the profile and the awareness of what we're doing as an industry is absolutely critical. And whilst a few years ago that was working well, it, there's been far less um, unified and positive messaging, um, possibly because it hasn't particularly fallen on, on, um, on a receptive regulator in the UK. But it's, um, it's very encouraging to see that. And as long as the industry um, steps up, then uh, we should be on a journey towards a much more collaborative relationship with all of the regulators. But it is actually rather a long journey ahead. Nick, um, let's, let's uh, call a spade a spade. This was all started by the British Gambling Commission, right? So uh, it's, uh, it, it has uh, spearheaded the drive towards enforcement all over Europe. It's a sort of contagion. Um, uh, 
Um, is it a contagion or is it uh, that the industry is so underperforming when it comes to compliance? Um, uh, I have on many stages been you know, outspoken in my criticism of, of the, you know, the approach the Commission has taken, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to change my tune. Frankly, they're doing their job. Now, the fact that it is um, that they are levying particularly swinging fines, I think is uh, at least arguably counterproductive. I, th I think it makes for a poor relationship. I would argue that their process of public statements um, under further undermines the trust in the industry that they criticize us for generating in the first place. But broadly speaking, they are a consumer regulator. They are concerned about harm minimization, and that's absolutely right. Um, we heard in one of the earlier panels an absolutely correct assessment of where the political and social attitude to gambling is, and that's been driven by an industry which has been profit-driven, which has um, uh, incentivized people to drive, in particular, VIP business, and lost its way a little. Um, I think the response of the UK regulator was not... Um, unsurprising. It's been very painful. I think in due course it will become a much healthier relationship, but it, not, not in the short term. But I think that what the other regulators are doing, they, yes, they may have seen what the UK are doing. They may think that the industry has, has lots of cash flow and that they can afford high fines. Of course, we know with, with regulation comes taxation and with, with swinging regulation come higher costs of compliance in particular fines, so it's, it's not a bottomless pit. Um, but I think it would be wrong to say that it's a contagion. It is a natural response to dot country regulation, and we have to be grown up enough to deal with it. Any comments from you? Sure. From, uh, yeah, from, from my perspective is that, of course, the UK Gambling Commission has been a model for, for the rest of Europe, and somehow there is a contagion uh, movement let's call it that way. But uh, there, is, uh, there are also other ingredients in this salad, uh, which are, from my perspective, first of all, as I said before, the market has become mature. Regulators have much more experience, they know much more about the business, and, and they have much more human resources, and again, means. Same that law firms. I mean, how many we were when we started on this, how many we are now? I mean, when things have go, or oh, things have went go well, uh, that's in the first place. But in the second place, uh, I would say that the yellow press that, uh, and, and, and the mediocre politicians that we have uh, nowadays, uh, and maybe I should underline this, uh, or should underline this in Malta You're today. Saying this at the right time, <laughs> <laughs> But I think the, the, the combination of both have put a pressure on the regulators that uh, are completely changing the, 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 the scene that we, we have been living during the last uh, years. Okay, any other comments? I would add, I would, sorry, go ahead. I, I would add one more thing. It is also a testament to the fact that notwithstanding the considerably varying approaches amongst regulators, we do share a core set of common values and common objectives. And I think these, these, um, uh, this increase in enforcement, especially on AML and on responsible gambling issues, shows clearly that certain things are at the heart of all regulators and that the regulators have become better at discussing amongst each other as well, at prioritizing and working together. Um, for example, something very, very sim a bit simpler, the, the joint declaration at GREF on loot boxes, for example, on, on the convergence between gaming and gambling. That, that, is, show, that is, is also a result of increased collaboration and increased discussion amongst regulators, because despite various differences, there are many commonalities, and this is a result of that. This, this uh, approach, the similar approach between various regulators on certain specific things shows the focus. Maybe just briefly adding to that, um, I, I also think that um, operators um, have meanwhile understood that um, bad cases make bad laws, right? Um, so in, in particular, when we talk about uh, RG, responsible gambling, AML, um, it, it has been put into the heads of everyone that um, the industry has to proactively address these issues 
um, because we've seen in many jurisdictions that if things go the wrong way, um, it is, of course, the political will to um, make laws even stricter and then potentially tend to overregulate, which obviously, again, does not help uh, the business, but it also doesn't help the objectives of the regulation because, of course, every regulator, as you just said, yeah, the objectives are um, more or less the same if you look into any uh, gambling regulation, at least across Europe, the objectives are always um, more or less the same. And in order to achieve these objectives, you have to be able to channel the market uh, into a regulated, into a national regulated market. Um, but in order to do that, it needs to be a viable market, a market in which operators can still uh, commercially um, offer a product that, at the end of the day, makes money. Yeah? Um, so I do think that um, operators in that regard have also uh, been waking up a bit. And, and uh, as, as a lawyer, you know, it's always a bit uh, difficult when you try to push compliance in, uh, in the debate. Um, and, and operators at, at some point just say, you know, we want to remain with the maximum position. But I, I have seen a change over the last years that um, um, the industry is backing off that position a bit, and you see that um, operators are making concessions um, to proactively address certain concerns. Just a short comment. I think that the gambling industry is more mature now, and uh, operators uh, um, um, needs to implement uh, compliance, uh, data protection regulations, uh, customer care regulations, and they need to understand that this is their, their daily activity. And it's sort uh, of expected from them now, yes. because the industry is more mature and therefore you are expected to up your game. Exactly. And one more comment regarding um, uh, regulators uh, in Europe. Um, the European market is uh, not harmonized. That's the one point. And the second issue is that the um, regulators uh, speak with each other. So there are many initiatives uh, across Europe uh, when some uh, members of the regulators meet, each, uh, meet uh, and, and speak it with each other regarding initiatives in, in, uh, in their jurisdictions. So it's, uh, um, that's, 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 I think, the answer on your question. And it's okay. So all the lawyers in private practice, so everyone except Carl. Um, <laughs> We need to justify the price of the ticket that uh, our audience has uh, paid to come here. And I would like you to give some free advice, um, not more than a couple of minutes, on what um, uh, operators should focus on to comply in your specific jurisdiction. So that you think that this is very particular to my jurisdiction. Uh, you're looking at me, so I'll start. Um, there are obviously so many um, pieces of guidance and there are so many areas of enforcement activity in the UK that it's very difficult to summarise but I would urge you if you have not already done so to go and read the Gambling Commission's enforcement report um, they've had a cut two or three of them now but the last one is a particularly insightful read into not only lessons learnt from the enforcement activity over the last 12 months but also some very granular suggestions about what you should be doing to avoid the same pitfalls. A lot of those are around being more inquisitive, which is a word that the Gambling Commission uses a great deal, in particular around the source of funds, understanding what they mean when they say source of funds rather than source of wealth is critical. And I would urge you to invest in compliance, give them the power to do their job properly, it's easier said than done on, on an island where compliance um, professionals are, you know, um, uh, very competitively sought. But, you know, that is the core message. Um, otherwise, if you do get embroiled in a compliance assessment or when you have your annual compliance assessment, be positive. Don't panic, as, as Steve said earlier on. And if, if, God forbid, it becomes a review, be, again, positive cautious about what you admit and what you don't admit, because um, uh, in particular with AML regulation, I, I think that the Commission in particular has a rather binary view about certain things, and I think the, the industry needs to 
be confident in the decisions that it's made. But if it, if it has had an absence of proper engagement with clients, then it, it's not going to be able to do that. So up your games, please. And if you really want to know the granular detail, go to the Gambling Commission's website and look at their enforcement report. Well, uh, in the case of Spain, it's not that there are new enforcement obligations or, or new infractions or whatsoever, but the truth is that the regulator has completely changed the way that things are being interpreted. They are not flexible anymore. And, and, and there are no more, uh, and this is for the new ones uh, in the recent uh, window that was closed a few months ago, there are no more adaptation, adaptation period. I mean, since day one, they expect you to comply. And the supervising and monitorizing activities that the DGOJ, our regulator, uh, has got uh, have become much more stronger. And so they are interpreting things in a way that, uh, you know, might conduct the operator to a uh, infringement, uh, so, sorry, to a, to a sanctioning procedure. Back in time, uh, whenever uh, one of our clients tell, told us, uh, look, uh, I have done this wrong, what should we do? Well, let's, let's inform the DGOJ and let's inform what are the reasons that what have you done to this not happen again? Now, uh, I mean, that was very welcome uh, by the regulator back in time. Now, it's more than probably that uh, if that happens, the, the operator receives uh, some kind of uh, information procedure. This information procedure usually precedes a sanctioning procedure. So <laughs> what should be the advice to, to, to those uh, that come now to the market in Spain? Because the ones that have been for years, they already know that the trend has changed in the last 18, 12 to 18 months, well, I would say be ready since day one, try to comply, uh, and, and do not expect flexible or flexibility by, at the time of interpreting things by, by the, the Spanish uh, regulator. Okay. Um, Carl, uh, I don't know if you want to add something, Nick or Eva. Maybe after Carl, um, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I have the, the joy of uh, representing, so to say, left. representing a um, unregulated jurisdiction. So I'd, I'd love to speak about, you know, enforcement guidelines like Santiago and Nick just did. Um, unfortunately, we do not have that in Austria currently. Um, what operators, foreign operators are dealing with, uh, in particular with regard to online casino, are uh, customer refund claims. Um, due to the alleged illegality of online casino um, being in violation of the Austrian gambling monopoly, um, which in my point of view is challengeable from an EU law perspective. Um, so uh, we're kind of looking at a different type of enforcement right now in Austria, quite opposite in, in sports betting. It's a liberal market, as, as most of you know, having grown operators uh, of the likes of Novomatic, uh, BWIN, Bet at Home, um, many large international operators, but again, enforcement currently in Austria is all about player claims, and um, my prediction for the next couple of months is that we will see a lot of uh, litigation coming up in Austria. Okay, Carl, um, uh, as a regulator, now, what is the MGA focusing upon? Uh, I understand that yesterday you have issued um, uh, new enforcement guidelines, I believe, um, uh, so what, where should operators, compliance teams, and advisors focus in order to um, uh, avoid enforcement action? Well, compliance is important across the board, obviously. I will never say anything different. But when it comes to both the nature of an enforcement measure that we take and um, the seriousness of the enforcement measure that we take, how, how strong it is, that is determined by a number of factors. And these guidelines that we issued yesterday are intended to make it more transparent. Santiago mentioned transparency earlier on uh, during the panel, to make it more transparent for the operators um, as to what can happen and what we will look at. So with regards to content, obviously, our regulatory objectives are set out in the law. We've, we've mentioned that they're shared amongst a number of regulators, the usual things, um, preventing crime, uh, ensuring that the vulnerable and minors are protected, so on and so forth. So if there is a breach that hits one of those regulatory objectives, then naturally, it will, be, it will be dealt with more seriously than if it does not impact one of those regulatory objectives. Then, as I mentioned before, it's about the behavior of the operator as well, um, both before the breach and after. So you have systems in place to try to prevent that, but it happened anyway. Uh, if not, when you discovered that breach, did you self-report or did you wait for the MGA to discover? 
Were you collaborative? Did you provide all information? Have you laid out a plan of how to avoid it happening again? So these guidelines are meant to, to educate the operators as to what we as a regulator expect, and just in the same way as we try to keep an open channel of communication with the industry, this is our way of explaining better where we are coming from when we take certain decisions. I think it's a very good initiative. Very good initiative. Well done. So, the last question. We only have three minutes left. So, uh, um, uh, this is a bit controversial, of course, um, as a last question. Um, so, we have AML, we have responsible gaming, we have GDPR. Are we over regulating this industry? Um, uh, will this favor the growth of offshore jurisdictions outside of Europe? I. I I don't think so. I mean, by definition, this industry, and, and I go back perhaps to the land-based regulation, uh, which comes before, or precedes the online regulation, has been always overregulated. And maybe it's the only way to, to, to move forward. I mean, to be socially viable, socially accepted by, by the society. I mean, people ignore uh, what's behind an online portal. I mean, when I am saying, for instance, when I say to friends, whatever, what do you do? Well, I, uh, a, business, uh, a gaming lawyer, a gaming lawyer, you say, why don't you create, a, a, why don't you have a, a casino? So, <laughs> I mean, you know what's behind that. When you know the money and investment and, and the number of professionals that are, they completely ignore that. So the only way that we can uh, be, you know, socially viable, as I said, is, is with overregulation, I guess. Point number one. Yeah, and um, maybe just briefly adding to that, um, regulation comes uh, with a lot of benefits for operators, be it on the share price, you know, if you can say, okay, I'm regulated in a number of uh, licensed jurisdictions um, because you have certainty in your operations. But of course, at the same time, that comes with a certain level of regulation. And I think, um, you know, we're in the 21st century, everyone understands that a certain level must be reached in order to, as Santiago just said, yeah, be, a, be an accepted industry. I mean, we, we as an industry want to, do, we want to be funded by the biggest banks. We want to have a good share price. We want to be, you know, viable for, for huge M&A transactions. All of that comes at the price, but I think it is important to understand that regulation can also drive value. Nick? I completely agree with both, uh, with both of you. I think there is, it's, it, it, there's obviously, a, there, are, there are good ways and, 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 and bad ways of, of, of regulating. And I think I yearn for, for the days in the future when the industry has a more collaborative and healthy relationship with regulators. Uh, but it, it, there's a reason that it doesn't have one at the moment, and that is broadly to do with what Santi described. It's, it's, um, we, we need to um, operate the business model in a way which is socially acceptable, so we have to um, recalibrate to an extent the business model and, and deliver uh, ethically. Okay, Eva? Uh, I think that there is no other way. It's just uh, the operators need to adjust their business model, and uh, and that's our future. The world is more complicated. Uh, everything is more complicated. So it's just part of <laughs> of, uh, of of it's the, the, the business. Of yes, that's the reality. Yes, exactly. What I would add in five seconds is that reputation is a driver for the industry, even with the players, not just the banks and possible acquirers and the regulators. But I, I think even players will want to play, if, uh, at least the majority, with uh, an operator that they know is seriously regulated as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, for the great panel. A round of applause, please, for the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.